So yes, hello, um, I'm Matt Gilchrist and this is Will Sandy and uh, we're the founding directors of the Edible Bus Stop. Um, essentially we transform urban spaces into design-led places and it's been our mission for the past six years now. We've realised a number of sites across London um, where we feel very strongly that it, to use design to engage communities is vital to get attention for these projects which are often woefully underfunded. Uh, so this is where our, our name derives, uh, the Edible Bus Stop in uh, Brixton, South London. Our work's kind of grown outside of this, but it's still working with a network. So we're creating a network of daily spaces that um, you use every day. They react with the community, whether you live, work or play in that area. Um, this is the kind of model we use, so we, we call it EAT. But most of our projects are about food growing. Um, engaging, animating and transforming. We, this is the second project on the same route, it's about growing the network but also building up a network of partners so seeing who can be involved, maybe they're ultra local to that area, maybe they're the Mayor of London because it's a focus on green infrastructure, enhancing biodiversity, air quality, incredible edible who you'll be talk, hearing about later, um, Grow Wild which is a, a a national campaign to grow wild uh, plants and native plants within the city. Uh. So um, when we create new sites we always obviously have to do engagements. Um, we do community uh, consultations prior where we get them involved in discussing the designs and what they might like to see grow there. But once it's actually open what we do is we have a, like, a nice opening event um, it's very important when you do this to engage with the local kids. They're, a, they're an absolute endless source of enthusiastic volunteers and volunteer fatigue is something that's very real in our world. So but these kids love it. They just, you know, give them some water, give them some dirt and, you know, they're really happy. And they're very, it's a great lesson to teach them that the lesson of delayed gratification, which is what you learn when you're growing food. You, you plant a tiny seed and then in several months later you can actually eat it. Fabulous. It's so uninstant. It's a really good story. Um, so whether it's, you know, Victorian Street in Stockwell or the Olympic Park, it's about... We, we, we want to create landmarks that stop people in their tracks and maybe, maybe take a photograph or feel a sense of identity. So this is in the new build of the Olympic Park, of the former athletes village there. So there wasn't really a community, it's just that they're just renting the, the, the properties. There was nothing there beforehand. So uh, our challenge was just to try and um, enable some sense of belonging as they came out of Stratford Station into the gateway of the uh, of the development. We did this through the utilising the bold colours of the, the, the organisation that had employed us to do so, their brand colours, the orange and the pink, but also this is London's newest postcode, so why not make it its edible postcode? So we held an event around the Chelsea Fringe, which we often utilise as a way of uh, sort of public, publicising events um, where we got the locals to help us plant the, the My E20 letters with herbs. Um, so yeah, building on that idea of identity, here's another site, slightly different contrast to the Olympic Park, but equally as important, the iconic building of the barrier block used in the Brixton Pound uh, money, uh, the local currency. We took that on board and uh, worked it into the design of the scheme, but it was also important to work with you know, the Brixton Design Trail, the, the, the newest uh, district in the London Design Festival. Uh, Vestra provided a lot of furniture. We worked with the Housing Association, the Brixton Bid. And they all saw the benefits of actually putting a little bit of time and money into this community. Because in the long run, it mitigates against um, the, the financial um, need to uh, look at antisocial behaviour, vandalism, maintenance. Putting money in at the beginning is something that we're trying to push forward as an idea where you're, in, you're, you're investing in a community, you're not, even in time, not just finances. And um, I heard yesterday someone say that if you don't invest in and in build a healthy and happy community, you'll be building a lot more hospitals. And so I think that's really important. We held this uh, community event at the local school. We worked with a local artist. Um, and um, I think... Yeah, so... By, again, playful engagement is very, very important because um, community consultation, let's face it, are really dull on the whole and nobody really wants to fill out surveys. So, you know, going back, 
we get we got the adults and the kids drawing with the local artists what would you like to see on the wall we get the kids out planting herb pots you know take them home maybe when we come up to, when we're actually planting you might have grown your herb and you might want to plant it in there you can keep it you can eat it they loved it and so the result of that consultation the, the, the community directly informed the art workers of what was going to appear in the wall. They came out, they helped us plant. It's fantastic. It's, it's been an absolute incredible transformation of an otherwise really imposing and ugly wall. So I guess we're inviting you to question the city. It's, it's where you live, it's where you work, it's where you play. Uh, this is a, a global kind of open source event called International Parking Day. They transform parking spaces on the third Friday of September every year. This was what we did in 2011 by Waterloo. Yes, it's fun, it kind of stops you in your tracks, but also it's got just simple messages that talk about a biodiversity. This was a micro woodland with each tree had its name, where it was from, how big it grew, what, it, what uh, biodiversity it encouraged. This was a pickup truck with a bay tree, we called it the parking bay. Um, and then wheelbarrows, which you'll see again in another project, are really important about showing how much space you can grow quite a lot of food in. So we think it's vital to attract attention. You've got to preach to the unconverted. Um, people who like gardening, they, nothing we can tell them. They can probably tell us much more about gardening. We're not gardeners. Uh, we're designers. We're, we create interventions that are, are, are there to, to improve the neighbourhood. So we, at International Parking Day, we did even crazy things like have a sustainable fashion show in a parking bay. So it, it did actually end up creating a lot of uh, attention on the day. And it was one of the things that stopped people in their tracks more than most things. Um, again, uh, a really spectacular transformation has happened from this really grey space in the South Bank to just animating it with plants. However, we've, what we've done here is where we've created the, the most fun uh, show plants I've ever had by giving them a roller coaster to ride along. Now they're all little mini wheelbarrows uh, with mini gardens, should I say, of edibles in it. And the idea was to create that inspiration of how little space you actually needed to grow edibles and how you can do it playfully. Because normally edibles are grown very sort of regimented and then that's all good. It's, very, it's all about function. But we wanted to bring an element of form in there so you have a bit more playful. And, and, and again, straight away, you're going to have kids being interested. And if you've got kids interested, you've got it nailed because they're the key. They are absolutely key in any response that we get to um, any installations that we do. Um, yeah, and we, we actually physically connected this project with the last one by walking those wheelbarrows down the South Bank to Voxel One to where the, the big kind of green infrastructure projects still are built growing, uh, the missing link. And they wanted us to cr transform this uh, car park into a green space that informed the future, created a platform for artists um, in the shadows of the Damien Hirst Gallery just down the road and the Beaconsfield Gallery. And so it's about fusing art, culture, design with these green infrastructure projects that engage that wider audience, make it more fun, make it more playful, um, but use them as, as also as natural wayfinding, create this identity using plants. Don't just fill the space with steel signs and what it benches, make it, make it green. Let's just use that as the, as the language. I mean, this is a perfect example of how uh, we were brought in to help promote something that wasn't about gardening. It was about creating a link of all the galleries in Vauxhall. But they used us, a landscape architecture firm, to create that wayfinding with that garden. Um, this is another example where we, we would argue, is it a garden or is it a sculpture? Or is it just both? It's both, in fact. Um, so this is an idea we've been exploring, is portable planted green infrastructure, and where you can drop it in on a site and give people a sort of sneak preview of how that site could be changed by some biodiversity being introduced to it. Um, the idea of temporary, people say, why invest in something that's not going to be there the whole time? We would argue, why, why not? You know, it, it creates that perfect instant transformation. It, it's showing rather than talking about it. It's graphical, it's tactile. And, and what we've designed here is this idea that it, it doesn't have to be temporary because it can be reused. Um, if you, so we've, we've built a toolkit of parts. They can be easily dropped into place, informing the permanent. It creates that conversation. If it doesn't work, you just move it. It's an asset to the client. You know, they come in all shapes and sizes. We were even looking at business units that can then animate that space, create 
low cost, inviting business units for startup businesses who then take an active responsibility in their public realm. And they have minimum disruption, they provide accessibility to the infrastructure underneath, so you can plant plants where infrastructure is, which is also, you know, you've got Blackfriars Road, it's a beautiful avenue, a new cycleway, yet there's no trees along it. If you put something like that, you can literally drop something on and lift it off like a lid when you need to access it. And then going forward, why does green infrastructure need to stop at the door? We all work inside from the majority of every day. It's that beginning of the day and the end of the day, maybe you pop out for lunch. Transport for London invited us to look at the underground and we went, how do we get green in the underground? So we developed a modular system that plugs into the ticket offices. They're unused spaces now. We're not saying take away the jobs, but they are becoming redundant. Um, so we've, we've created the system that plugs in and it just gives you that breath of green air as you pass through the station. Um, I think Matt's going to talk about biophilia. So biophilia. Um, human beings have an innate connection to nature. Biophilia is a term that describes this. It's just that the, the feel-good factor we feel around greenery is real. It's, it's, it's very present. And so the idea with the, the tiny park of St. James's Park by creating these grow units that slot into the windows of the former ticket offices it's a bad news story that the ticket offices have closed. We're creating a good news story by, oh, but now look, you can look at this lovely greenery in there and I feel so much better for it. Biophilia, raising the collective serotonin levels by utilising green infrastructure. So, well, you may have actually seen some of our uh, uh, green infrastructure here on the main avenue outside the avenue somewhere that way um, and our double yellow lines they first showcased uh, back in 2012 at uh, RHS Hampton Court and were the most popular um, showcase garden of that year um, here we have taken something that was ordinary and made it extraordinary the double yellow line so by doing so we can straight away I've been watching people the past three days stopping photographing, smiling, sitting on them, loving them, feeling the rosemary, smelling them. I mean, the rosemaries have taken a battering. People love to just, mmm, ah, rosemary, lovely. It's just, it's, there's something about it that's very tactile, it's very inclusive, it's very inviting. It's not, it, it's design that's accessible. And that's what we, we're really trying to, uh, with all our projects, is to make it inclusive and accessible, to make these active spaces real. A, a point that I forgot to raise earlier is that when Will talks about um, if we don't make healthier um, landscapes, we're going to have to build more hospitals. Um, I was recently doing some research that in 2007, the, the sedentary urban lifestyle cost the NHS one to 1.8 million pounds. Billion, sorry, billion pounds. That is just just off the scale, crazy. We have to get people to engage with these uh, in their in their communities, and what, how better than by doing it through creating gardens, which they're invited to tend. All of our gardens are open for the community to tend. Go back. Go back. Um, and just going, building on that idea of hospitals, the, the conversation that's come from this is actually, you know, you've got more Fields Eye Hospital, you've got that green walk from the station. Why can't we introduce green along those those wayfinding routes? through hospitals, through universities, you've all got to navigate them. Why not introduce seating? Why not introduce green space along those routes to provide these sort of dwell points where you have these little bursts of green that do make you happier, they do make you healthier. And if you put them in the health system, surely that's got to be a good thing. Um, and then food bridges so many different cultures, languages. This is in Albania. We're working there. We don't speak Albanian, but we understand that by introducing green space and we were commissioned to look at this site which is the former dictator's villa no one's been in it since the fall of the regime and they they see the value in looking at the garden as a platform to have a conversation about what to do with the building they don't want to celebrate the past but they want to acknowledge it so we've created this physical bridge over the the boundary wall which grows the garden out into the street and i think that's what we're kind of trying to say to you today is try and take some ownership of the space outside your front garden fence then you'll start talking to your neighbors then you'll start engaging with the local businesses and you'll get a much stronger community and i think that can't be a bad thing
Um, uh, just as a sidebar to this particular project, um, we always try, as I say, when we do our public engagements to, uh, and, and the community consultation, to, get, to gauge what people want in the garden because we can't put it, place it on them. There's not one size fits all. So we were talking with the Albanians on our reconnaissance uh, mission last year and we found a little bit of resistance about growing edibles and I couldn't quite put my finger on it and eventually it came out that that to them symbolised the cold communist years when they all grew their own potatoes and cabbages. So I said, how about we don't grow potatoes and cabbages and we grow fruit and strawberries and, you know, fun stuff and herbs and like unusual different salads. Then they liked it. But the idea of something edible that was going to be cabbages and potatoes just went down like a lead weight. So that's us. Um, if you have any inquiries, please do come and talk to us. Um, and uh, we hope you dug it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.